in the park. Um, so if you can come join us for that, that'd be great. We're going to, you know, hopefully be seeing a lot of uh, what we're going to go through in this presentation today uh, for the real deal in the park. So, so we'll see. Um, and yeah, uh, wildlife tracking, animal tracking, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I've uh, been having fun doing this probably for about 20 years or more um, or so, mostly here in the Northeast, but I've also been a park ranger um, in Minnesota and in uh, Glacier National Park in Montana as well. So um, here and there around the country. Um, and the Northeast is a great place to do it. Uh, one of the big reasons um, is because we do get this layer of snow um, this time of year, which, you know, of course, animals leave tracks, you know, every day of the year, they're out there, just a lot harder to see in the spring, summer, or fall than it is in the winter. And, you know, after we get fresh snow, like we're getting today, um, you know, after a couple of days, there's going to be, uh, you know, lots of activity out in the woods that we can look at. Um, and another reason I like tracking is because it requires very little special equipment or gear or anything like that. Really, all you need is, you know, kind of a trusty tracking book and uh, your senses. Um, you know, you just got to see what's in front of you. Um, obviously, sight is a big part of it. You now, looking at the tracks or the sign uh, that you see, but also um, hearing, I consider part of tracking just because, um, you know, animals make all sorts of different sounds, even when you can't see them. Uh, red fox are very vociferous and make all sorts of interesting sounds, you know, as do many other animals, uh, moose and deer and coyotes, of course, and um, you know, many others. So um, hearing is a part of tracking, sense of touch too. come up to this spot here with this moose fed on the street and, you know, kind of feel it with your fingers and notice that it's only strips that are going upwards, um, which you now gives you a clue as to that was a feeding activity by the animals. We'll talk about that more later. Um, and a uh, sense of smell even. Uh, red fox here again. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but this time of year they um, do a lot of scent marking because it's uh, mating season for these animals. And um, a lot of times you can smell them before you even see the tracks or anything because it's a pretty potent um, scent marking uh, that they're doing this time of year. And, um, you know, as kind of using your senses uh, and kind of solving these clues and mysteries, I often think of it, um, and you're, you're kind of like one of those people on those TV detective shows, um, you know, one of the more notable popular ones the past couple of decades now um, is called uh, CSI, you know, Crime Scene Investigations, where they use all their special equipment, but um, you don't have to use that special equipment. We just use our senses, as I said, which is why um, I, I like calling my program TSI, Track and Sign Investigation, which, you know, similar idea. Um, and these are all the animals that uh, left those signs behind there. So, and there are some of your ears, using your ears too for, for tracking. I consider that tracking or hearing birds and animals and other um, creatures, amphibians even making their sounds. So it's all, it's all part of the same deal, in my opinion. Um, so we'll make them be quiet there for a second. Um, and there are you know many reasons for tracking. Uh, one is of course just for fun as well. It's a great hobby, especially this time of year when um, you know if you have the winter doldrums and you're not much of a skier or that kind of thing. Um, you know you can track right in your driveway or you know anywhere there's uh, you know kind of a fresh layer of snow. It's an easy kind of hobby to pick up, um, and it really increases your, um, your your senses as we've been talking about. You just can't help but be more focused when you're tracking uh, because. You know, you're kind of right there in the moment. You're you're seeing what's in front of you, hearing it, smelling it, touching it. So it really, it has a, a great uh, you know, ability to focus you. Um, and kind of as a fun little exercise here, I'm going to flash a picture on the screen real quick. Um, I don't know if you guys have the ability to put in a chat or, or at all, but if you do, um, go ahead and put in what you think you saw. Um, if if you don't you know, have the ability, don't worry about it. We'll we'll we'll, we'll figure it out from there. But um, so yeah, I'm just going to show you a real quick photo here and see how how good your uh, you know your 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 senses are at figuring out what this is. All right, what do, what do you guys think you saw? Julian, can we see notes on this or are chats in that or is that not a thing? We can see chats. Some people are saying a person or a bear. All right, good. For some reason I don't see the the chat notes there, but um, yeah. That exactly, when I first saw this photo, I thought it was a person running through the woods with a backpack on or something. That's kind of what it looks like. Um, but when you actually zoom in and see the real picture, 
it's a dog coming at you. Uh, that's its face, its tail, its two feet and everything. So just one of those ones where, you know, uh, when you're tracking, you're just glancing at something and moving on, you're often missing a lot of the details. Uh, but, you know, it sure does look like a person running uh, through the woods when you, when you first look at it. But uh, bear was pretty close. That was pretty good. Um, you know, people who said that for sure, I thought that was the person the first time I saw it. Um, and, you know, other, you know, kind of more technical reasons for tracking, um, it's, it is a scientific endeavor, it's not just a hobby, you know, it's been used by, um, you know, parks and natural resource areas and other experts for, for many decades, for centuries, really, even if they go back to Native Americans as part of their, you know, daily existence. Um, and it's a great way to learn about, you know, the, what were the animals in a non-invasive way of, um, you know, learning about the animals that we're sharing our parks and neighborhoods with. And you do get to be a mystery solver, as I've been saying, which is, uh, you know, makes it even more kind of a fun thing. You know, you can kind of solve perhaps who stole the breakfast sausage um, is a great, uh, you know, mystery you might be able to solve, uh, you know, one of these days. Maybe we'll never know. Maybe we'll figure it out. But, uh, you know, it's a, a pretty good clue with, that, with the tracks left behind there. Um, and uh, as the climate changes, animals uh, are moving around too. You know, they're obviously impacted by climate as well. So you know, scientists can see um, you know, how they're being impacted by the effects of climate change is uh, the way that they're kind of moving um, when, they, when they have to because of changing conditions. And maybe my, my favorite reason for tracking is it really does open up a new animal uh, language to you, a world of animal language. Uh, what I mean by that is um, you know, just by kind of examining a few holes in the snow, you can answer a whole bunch of questions about what's happening up there. Most obvious, of course, is, you know, who was there, but sometimes you can answer why were they there. Sometimes you can figure out what happened just by looking at these holes in the snow. Um, and sometimes you can even figure what their mood was, which is pretty amazing um, when you think about it, with just, you know, a, a few uh, tracks that they, they left behind. Um, and this is a great example. We'll clear kind of the, the palette here a little bit of what I'm talking about. Uh, this picture I took in the National Park um, a bunch of years ago now. Um, it's about March, uh, which is important because um, these are tracks of fisher. This is a male fisher heading towards the camera. Um, this is a female fisher cutting across from left to right. Um, you can see one that the male was much larger than the female. Um, and this is also mating season um for fisher is is march so males start to kind of expand their range and kind of look around a little bit more for potential mates um and when we kind of uh roll the footage here you know we see the male went this way and again the female crossed his path a little bit later but what we see is after she went over it she put the brakes on um immediately stopped she must have got a scent and after she went over she smelled them um, that this is something new this is a new animal in my territory you know what's going on here this is a walking pattern um, of Fisher. So she took her time, walked right up to the tracks here. You can see her front two feet here um, and a male's track right there. Again, the size difference is pretty intense. And what was she doing? She was sticking her nose right in that track. Um, she was getting a sense that this is a male Fisher. Um, you know, she could probably get some idea of what its health was. They have, all animals have glands on the bottom of their feet that they leave sent behind, which actually um, gives clues as to, you know, the health of the animal, the sex of the animal, the age of the animal, all those kind of things. They can tell just from smelling these tracks, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then when she kind of satisfied her curiosity, she went off to under normal business is what she's going about her day. So, um, you know, again, pretty cool to be able to see that just with the some tracks in the snow here. <clears throat> Um, and it's also helpful um, to kind of set up a, uh, you know, rules for yourself when you go out. I try not to put too many rules on tracking, but just more of a, a rule of thumb, I guess, is um, you know, a good way of thinking about it. And that is to never say never or never say always. Uh, I, try, I always try to remember, uh, remind myself when I'm tracking just because, you know, tracking can humble you pretty quickly when you really think you know something really well and you know, you're positive that you're following the tracks of a uh, bobcat or something and then you know once you kind of get more clear tracks you can see that it was a, a domestic dog or something that had you know interesting rounder um, kind of tracks that are left behind so always keep an open mind don't jump to decisions too quickly you know um, keep in mind that while guidebooks are great um, the animals they don't know how to read uh, they don't know what they're supposed to do quote unquote out there you know sometimes they can get a little confused um, you know, you hear uh, cat tracks, you know, they uh, often read that they don't leave claw marks in their tracks, which is true most of the time, but it's not true all the time. Sometimes they will leave claw marks in the tracks, depending on 
what they're doing. So again, just uh, always keep an open mind when, when you're tracking. And my other kind of uh, rule one and a half, I call it, is uh, another reason that tracking is great is because you can only have to go as deep as you want. By that, I mean, if you're a very detail-oriented person um, and you're really like, getting to the nitty-gritty of something, I mean, tracking is uh, for you, for sure. Um, you, know, you can study the intimate details of a weasel's uh, you know, paws, seeing the metacarpal pads and the digital toe pads, and you know, rem remember how many toes each one has. And, you, know, you can measure down to an eighth of an inch of uh, you know, each track as you go and learn all these different tracking patterns and um, lopes and gallops and trots and all that kind of thing. Or you can save, you know, pretty high level and just learn, you know, what a basic track looks like for a squirrel um, and walk by and go, oh, look, that's where a squirrel went by and, you know, keep on going. Um, you don't have to get into this super detail, but, you know, it, it certainly is uh, available to people who want to do it. And it does enrich your experience uh, doing it as well, too, of course. Um, another kind of part of, scat of tracking is uh, scat, um, you know, animal droppings, as we call it. I call it scategories uh, myself. Um, and, you know, it's not everybody's favorite thing. Um, you don't have to, um, you know, get involved with the animal poop if you don't want to. Again, you can totally leave that part behind, but it does uh, give a, a whole other, you know, kind of uh, view into an animal's life because when you see what comes out of an animal, obviously you know what went into an animal. So for just a couple of examples, uh, moose, deer, and deer as well, their winter diet and summer diets are so different that, you know, the, what were kind of the classic deer and moose poop, you know, we're used to seeing these large pellets. That's only something that happens in the winter and kind of fall when their diets switch to a much more woody material. In the summer, um, they're eating a lot more plant leafy material and it kind of looks a lot more like cow patties. And it doesn't last nearly as long as the more woody material too. You know, deer scat from the you know, winter can last for several weeks or months even. Whereas, you know, it kind of breaks down a lot quicker um, when it's just much more organic material. Um, you know, you can see otters, they have, have a heavy diet of uh, uh, aquatic animals uh, and um, uh, crawfish is a big one. You often see that in their scat, depending on what a coyote is eating. If they had a fresh meal that's, uh, you know, kind of full of, not to get too graphic, but, you know, fresh or organs and, and blood it tends to be a dark um scat, whereas if they're scavenging off of a, a carcass, uh, a lot more hair and bones are in there. So again, I know all sorts of interesting kind of things you can tell from just kind of looking at a animal scat um, that, that, you know, kind of paints a bigger picture for you. <clears throat> um, and kind of getting into some of the details of tracking um, and, you know, what I find just you know, a hole in the snow, kind of seeing you know what uh, the, the uh, one image will track is can only tell you so much. It really gives you more information and it helps you identify you know what the species is better, is by looking at the kind of the gait of the animal. But a gait, I mean G A I T, um, kind of the way it's moving. Was it a walk, a trot, a gallop? Um, and all animals, for the most part, <clears throat> I kind of made up this equation that you see at the top there because. Now, most animals that, you know, we'll be tracking have, you know, four legs. Uh, we're not going to be tracking people out there, uh, hopefully too much. Um, and it's kind of a combination of, you know, their four legs times how fast they're going, their speed, divided by uh, the substrate, meaning were they walking through deep snow, were they running on pavement, were they going through a dusty field, you know, grass, whatever. That's all going to change the way they're moving. And all this is all underlined by you know, the kind of the principle of a conservation of energy. Wild animals especially don't really know where their next meal is coming from. So whenever possible, they like to conserve energy uh, as they're moving. They don't have a lot of wasted movements out there. Um, that's not to say they don't play from time to time, but it's a lot less often than, uh, than when you let your dog uh, outside and just kind of goes nuts uh, running around having fun all the time out there because they're not worried about their next meal. They know it's coming from you. So, you know, there's not, not a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, business-like movement as you see more with the wild animals. <clears throat> and, um, you know, getting closer and closer here to individual um, tracks of, of animals that we're going to be looking at is, uh, you know, breaking them down at these kind of usual suspects. Uh, there's no reason, uh, I just realized I, I was going through this earlier, when I click on it, it turns red. So there's no reason that those are red right now. Just pretend those aren't red. Those are, those are, those are all white. Um, but if you can kind of build your list of usual suspects, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, if you're here in Vermont and you're looking for tracks of mountain goats, you know, you're probably going to be looking for a while. Um, they're, they're not uh, you know, around here. So knowing what animals are in your neighborhood, obviously, is a good way of, of starting. 
Um, even then, though, it's kind of a daunting large list of, of animals. You know, where do you start? Um, and the way I like to do it, it's going to break it down just like you uh, have family members, you have distant family members, or you have your brothers and sisters, but you have your cousins, aunts, and uncles too. Um, animal families, quote unquote, are kind of the same. You know, there's a, a mustelid, a weasel family, from fisher to mink to striped skunk to otter, they all share similar characteristics um, and they move in similar ways. Um, that's the same thing is true with the dog family, you know, the gray, red fox coyotes that we have here, the cat families as well, um, in which you're kind of putting them into their categories. Um, it kind of makes it a little bit less daunting and makes it a little more, you know, uh, you can kind of put them into groups and, you know, look for the signs of these groups rather than even the, just the individual tracks is a good way to start sometimes. Um, and speaking of starting, I think we're going to, uh, you know, the plan is kind of just to uh, go over a few of these species um, with you all uh, and then hopefully maybe we can put up to some requests in here we'll see what we have for time i think we're doing pretty good I, I buzzed through all that in about 20 minutes so that's not so bad sorry if i'm talking quickly but i want to um make sure we're able to kind of do the actual tracking part of tracking um you know as we get into this and, and get see some of these um tracks and understand these animals a little better and red fox is a great one to start with just because they are so active uh, this time of year. Um, they are, uh, you know, again, this is their mating season. Um, they're, they're usually pretty solitary animals, but to this time of year, they do pair up. Um, so it's, more often we'll see their tracks together. And again, you're gonna smell them um, a little bit more often than you would uh, other times of year. Their, their uh, scent marking, their urine has a scent to it all year long, but it's especially pungent this time of year. And it can often be confused with a skunk, um, it smells, you know, quite skunky, but not, it's quite a little more musky than skunky, if, if you kind of know what that means. Uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to smell some. Very exciting to smell, uh, um, you know, fox scent marking uh, out there in the woods. Hopefully we'll have a chance to do that um, this, this weekend if you're able to come along. Um, and fox, maybe the most surprising thing uh, for people who are kind of just getting into tracking is realizing just, realizing just how small uh, red fox are. Um, you know, males are larger than females, um, and they range from eight to 15 pounds, uh, maybe a little bit on the larger end sometimes, but for the most part, you know, pretty tiny. Um, a lot of people on this, you know, call probably have house cats that are approaching that or, or, or larger. Um, so they're, they're not, uh, you know, not very big animals. Uh, they're, especially this time of year when they're all fluffed up with their winter coats and their tails, you know, they might look a little bit bigger than they are, but uh, especially in the spring, in the summer, when they lose a lot of this winter fur, you can tell um, you know, that just how small they are. Um, and they, uh, you know, continuing kind of with the size differences that we can see here. We don't have gray wolf here, but when they do overlap, you can see the differences. Um, this isn't my uh, trail cam uh, pictures, but someone did some kind of Photoshop magic and added, you know, these animals are all here at the same time. They, they added them in um, with Photoshop one after another, but. It is amazing, you know, this is a full grown red fox. It can literally run, you know, underneath this gray wolf without even br brushing its belly because um, they're so much smaller uh, than fox. And even coyote, you know, they can almost run underneath the, the, the legs of a coyote as well too. So um, they, 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 again, uh, you know, uh, tiny animals, but that doesn't mean they're not very capable predators as well too. Um, you know, there's many uh, deer mice and field mice uh, I bet their demise you know, staring down the throat of a uh, of a red fox. Uh, they'll hunt um, grouse and birds, and you know if chickens. Uh, if they can get to your chickens, of course, as they're well known. Um, and they will do um, you know other smaller animals, uh, rabbits. Probably um, snowshoe hare, probably one of the largest prey that they can get. Um, you know that they'll, they'll try to go after, but you know not much larger than that. Um, and as part of kind of the uh, tracking with our ears, uh, again, we're going to listen to a few different sounds that red fox can make. Again, this is a time of year where you are pretty likely to hear them just because uh, they're a little bit more vociferous during mating season, especially the females, but males will make um, um, calls too. So uh, we'll just kind of listen to a couple of their different calls here and you can see, you know, sometimes people will hear some of these and um, I guess I know I've heard that they've been some calls to 911 after they hear some of these calls, but they think somebody's screaming for help somewhere because um, they can kind of sound blood curdling. Um, so let's take a listen to a couple of these. That's more just the bark. 
That's kind of a scream. Probably communicating to one another, um, often between uh, mates and their kits. Um, they're, they're communicating back and forth with these kind of interesting little grunts and <laughs> things that they do. So, uh, and that's just a, a scattering of their, their vocal abilities. Again, they, uh, they, they, they can make a lot of different sounds. Um, and getting into the actual tracks uh, in this tracking presentation uh, of uh, Red Fox. Um, this is, uh, you know, obviously a great way to identify an animal is through, um, you know, the, the holes it leaves behind in the mud or snow or whatever else it's walking through. Um, and Red Fox, in the winter especially, um, it's a little different because uh, they tend to grow their own mittens on their feet. They become very furry, uh, covers you know, almost completely their toe pads and heel pads, whereas other times of year it starts to you know, fall off a little bit more and you get to see a little bit more of their toe pads, which of course you know, affects the tracks that they're leaving behind. This time of year, they tend to be a little bit more muffled, almost like you know, if you put your hand um, in the snow with a kind of a thick mitten on or something, you know, it's not going to be quick as... Um, quite as uh, you know sharp as it would be otherwise without your without your uh, just putting your hands in there. Um, and so but their feet are furry generally year round. Um, even with that fur, you can see um, that you know there's this heel pad here. it's called a chevron shape or a boomerang shape and that um, often um, shows up in the tracks not all the time, but when it does, it's a great kind of um, diagnostic uh, sign of red fox because, there's really no other animals that have that kind of shape of a heel pad. So if you're consistently seeing that in the tracks, you know, you have a very good, you know, kind of clue that you're seeing the tracks of a red fox um, left behind. It's more prominent in the front tracks and the hind tracks, but the hind also leave it sometimes. Um, here's another look of a front track here with a very clear um, boomerang shape with a, the rear track that doesn't have quite the same thing. Um, and the you know, red fox being small and light, they don't always leave the most uh, kind of robust, um, I know, tracks, even in mud. Um, here we see a nice kind of clear uh, front track. And here, if you look closely to you, can, you can see the, how furry the tracks are, even this time of year. Um, you know, clear signs of fur on the tracks. You have that, that bar in the back there that sometimes it's a little flatter looking um, than it is uh, boomerang shape. And the much more lightly left behind rear track that you know you have to kind of look a little bit harder to see, and it makes sense. You know when you kind of look at the body maps of animals, uh, red fox here, of course, you know its head and shoulders and neck muscles and shoulder muscles are all being supported by its front two feet, whereas its hind feet are just supporting that very fluffy tail and you know kind of small rear end that it has there. So obviously. More weight up front means more robust tracks for the front tracks. This is true in many animals um, as well. Um, so usually the front tracks for most animals are larger and uh, more kind of robust uh, than the hind tracks. Not always black bear are pretty heavy, so they're going to be leaving you know pretty uh, ro robust tracks both for front and rear. But for animals like fox and coyote and things like that, um, you do tend to see that a little bit more. Um, just another beautiful example of uh, you know, how furry their feet are um, that they can leave behind. And also, you know, uh, claw marks uh, will often show up in the tracks. It can either be really subtle or they don't always show up. Here, you know, this little dot uh, on the top of this one is a claw mark, but it just, you know, you kind of have to look for it really closely. Maybe this one is too here and that there too, but it's not like super obvious. So, um, you know, you do have to... Uh, when I say fox do leave claw marks, again, most times, but in the shallow mud like this, you know, it might not always show up so easily. Um, and the uh, other great way to kind of learn animal tracks is uh, to learn about these gates that I was talking about earlier, um, G-A-I-T gates, which is uh, the, their preferred ways of moving. Uh, all animals kind of have their way they, they like to move, you know, most often when they're trying to moving around their territories. Uh, you know, us as humans, we're walkers for the most part, but of course we can run and jump and skip and hop and all that other kind of things. You know, animals as well have many options available to them, but red fox particularly like to move in this, what's called a direct register trot. Don't get too caught up in the kind of the the the, uh, the names of things I'm giving here. A lot of tracking books give different names to different kind of uh, gates, but um, you know more focus on what you're seeing, which is in this case each hole in the snow 
is actually where a front foot and a hind foot came down in. Um, and the why the animal is doing this, it goes back to that conservation of energy thing. Even though I do, you know, see red fox do this even over like pavements, uh, you know, if they went through a puddle or something, you, you can kind of see that if they go across pavement or even shallow dust or that kind of thing, more often moving in this, this direct register trot maybe than other animals. But it's especially energy saving and deeper snow. You know, when you think about it, uh, if you're walking through the woods with a friend um, in snow and they're ahead of you, you know, most often you're going to use that exact same holes in the snow that they just made to put your feet in because it's a lot easier. You know, if you're the one breaking trail, you're the one who's breaking the sweat usually. Um, but uh, if you have four legs, you know, it makes sense. Well, I just made this great hole in the snow with my front foot. Why wouldn't I use it for my hind foot? Because, you know, over the course of a day when they're moving many, many miles, um, you know, that can save significant amount of energy um, if they're going to reuse that same hole over and over again. Um, and it's called direct register because the hind foot is directly registering right on top of where that front foot just was. Um, that's the reason they say that. Um, and you can see that uh, in this uh, track here too, obviously something else happened uh, in this series of tracks. Um, this is where uh, a scent mark was left behind. Um, and it was left behind most likely by a female too, we can tell just because of the way I know she squatted here too much imagination to see that. Um, and though males will sometimes squat as well, and females will sometimes left a leg. So it's not always 100% diagnostic, but um, usually if it's a male, um, you know, because their plumbing is different, let's say, uh, that that mark will be left a little bit further up um, than it is with the females. It's almost you know, right between her hind legs. So it's, you know, it's a, again, a good uh, clue that this is a female going through a territory. And they, um, you know, they can mark as much as 70 times in one hour uh, when they're really active. So it's not uncommon to come across uh, your red fox uh, markings and smell them before you come to them. Again, especially this time of year when they're very pungent. Um, but let's take a look at exactly how you know, these kind of tracks are, are made here. Um, this is a photo of a red fox doing a direct register trot. Um, and the reason I know that is because um, when they're moving in this gate, um, they're their legs move in kind of perfect synchronicity on opposite sides of the body. It's almost like you know, they're connected by a cable. Um, the front left leg and the rear right leg are moving in exact synchronicity, um, you know, same vice versa with the opposite side of the body. So that when you know, this foot comes out of this hole, this foot is going to land pretty much right in that same spot. And luckily, uh, I've dug up some videos as well that will kind of help us uh, see what that is. Uh, I know I've had trouble in the past where people aren't quite able to see these videos. So um, can you see that on the screen? Are you guys getting a view of this little video box? You are? Excellent. Okay. I'm going to make it bigger. Um, and I don't think we can see a video box. Oh, you can't. Um, okay. I think there's a way to fix that. Um, let's see here. I think I need to change the way I'm sharing. Um, new share. Uh, let's see here. Well, let, let me uh, yeah, let me try this again here. Um, if it doesn't work, it's not that big of a deal. We can we can work around it. But uh, I'm gonna actually, um, yeah. Here we go. How about now? Yep, we can see it. Excellent. Uh, all right, so here we have a, uh, a young red fox and you know, a really tiny one that's actually going to be going this direct register trot here. So you can see, you know, uh, we're going to back it up and look at that again. But you can see how, um, you know, bouncy it is, how much those are um, in their kind of uh, you know, synchronized uh, ways that the, the front and the hind legs are moving together. Let's see if I can um, get this so we can move frame by frame so you can see a little easier. Here we go. So now it's pretty clear to see that you know, the front left and rear right legs are moving and synchronicity and vice versa. And that you know, as this hind foot comes down, it's basically going to land on or right near where that front foot just left. Um, so this is very bouncy. Again, your, your house cat, if you have one, moves in this way most often. Um, so you, know, you start to get an eye for it, even without seeing the tracks, you were able to tell that that was a direct register trot that they were doing. Um, and it's, you know, again, a very common way for red fox to move, even though this isn't obviously deep, you know, snow or anything like that. It's just the way that they tend to like to move uh, most times. Um, so 
Let's see, can you see the regular screen again now? Or what are you, what are you seeing? <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted, Janelle. I'm still seeing the video. Okay, all right. I think, I think I'm gonna figure this out. Um, there we go. That's a, that's a good picture of diagonal. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, all right. So I think, I think we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're yeah, back to where we're supposed to be. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Um, so yeah, this is a, obviously a different way uh, of the animals being able to move. This is a gallop. Um, most books that you read will define a gallop as when the hind two feet, which are actually these two tracks in the snow, uh, land in front of the front two feet. Which takes, if you're just getting into tracking, takes a little kind of mental Olympics to kind of, you know, picture why how the hind feet are part of their front feet. But you know, uh, the reason for that is kind of the general rule of thumb is the faster an animal is moving, a gallop is pretty fast, um, the farther their hind feet will land in front of their front feet. Um, it's just the way uh, kind of the physics of the body as it's moving through the air. Um, and we can see that uh, again by the same red fox, which I'm gonna do my, my, my deal here. Go back to the media player, okay. So this red fox is very cooperative in the sense that it did this, um, trot in the beginning um, and then it decided to run back because it was getting a little nervous so um, <clears throat> here it is shaking it off deciding you know what I don't like being out here I'm gonna get back quickly to where I was so again a bit of a blur um, in regular speed but we do have the ability of course to slow it down so let's do that here and as it kind of goes by the camera you're gonna actually see that um, as its two front feet are coming down so here comes the front uh, two feet are down the rear end is up in the air. And as we roll, the rear end is actually going to fly through the air and kind of land, you know, as the animal gains speed further and further in front of where those front feet were. So there you can see that they went further and it's going fast, you know, it's can't tell in slow motion here, but it's gaining speed as it's getting closer to the woods here. Uh, the front two feet are down, rear feet again landing in front of where those front two feet were. This one I think it's really obvious. Front two feet are just leaving, and then you can see those rear feet landing in front. So um, and another reason I like looking at videos like this is because, you know, now you kind of have that um, mental image uh, in your mind. Um, you, know, you can, uh, when you see tracks like this, you can actually have that kind of, you know, theater of your mind uh, show you that red fox just ran by right there and you can, you know, visualize it, which is a lot of fun, um, you know, kind of adds another whole new dimension. Now we're spending a lot of time on red fox here, I realize, but the reason is it's uh, the way they move is a very similar to other animals. You know, it's not, these aren't just uh, you know, obviously the only way is that red fox move. Uh, coyote will move this way, deer will move this way, bobcats will move this way, all sorts of different animals do. So red fox are just a good one to focus on. Um, and this one is called the rotary gallop, which um, is um, for whatever reason that it's the, when you see this track pattern in the snow or anywhere, and this is as fast as this animal can move. This is their, their fastest gait. When you let your dog outside to run around and play, it's often using this rotary gallop or C gallop is sometimes called because it kind of leaves these, you know, elongate C's as a pattern. Um, and it's called the rotary gallop because of the way uh, the footfalls come down. Um, so for example, on the transverse here, which means diagonal basically, um, you're having a right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, we're front and rear. Here, it's uh, a, the, the footfalls go around the body in a circle. So what you have is a, is a front right and a rear left, and then a rear left and a rear right. Um, just having that extra kind of momentum push the animal further allows it to push itself faster. Um, cheetahs run with rotary gallops. Um, you know, that's kind of their, their way when they're going you know, 60 to 70 miles an hour. Um, and this is a, another view of a rotary gallop. It doesn't have to always be in that direction. It can be in the other direction. And you can see that this animal is obviously moving pretty quickly. When you look at the distance between the sets of tracks, front right, I'm sorry, front left, um, front, front left, front right, rear right, rear left, and then this big gap in between where you know, it flew through the air and did the same there, you know, leaving this, this C pattern. So uh, that's a red fox that was really moving along. Um, and we have another video here that uh, shows that very well. Um, this is a, a even better kind of quality video. Um, and it's already in slow motion, but we're, we're going to uh, slow it down even more. Um, and you can see it uh, in here in the sense that, uh, you know, that, that the footfall pattern is here. Uh, and 
it's, it's clear in the slow motion video of the way it comes down. Um, other way, you know, it's a little hard to see, um, again, the way the feet are falling with the naked eye, but what you can see with the naked eye is, uh, you know, these two kind of uh, forms of suspension, they're called, and when the animal is fully off the ground. So this animal, you know, is fully off the ground right now, and it's called extended suspension because it's kind of got its arms and legs spread out like Superman, um, as you can see there. Um, and this is only happens in this rotary gallop or the sea gallop. And now, now we'll count the footfalls as they come down. So there's a front right, front left, rear end up in the air, flying through the air. And then, you know, significant distance, the rear left or rear right. So again, we're seeing this in the um, rotary pattern here. And so we saw the extended suspension, and now this is called gathered suspension. So there's two points where it's totally off the ground. One is where the feet are spread way far apart. Another one is where they're all bunched in together like this. Um, and again, this happens during that uh, that running uh, galloping pattern. And you'll see this in your dog too, you know, as it's running around. Um, it leaves us, uh, this, you can see that with your eyes, even though it's really hard to see how fast where the feet are landing because it happens so quickly. But, you know, in the tracks, we can see it afterwards. So, um, you know, again, animals, they don't move. They tend not to move, wild animals anyway, they tend not to move this way very often because it is, you know, uses a lot of energy to do so. You know, they'd rather move and they're more um, standard ways that they do. So it's, there's reasons that they're doing this is because they want to get out of somewhere quickly. You know, this one was in an open field um, somewhere where maybe they felt a little exposed and wanted to get to the woods. Um, this one, I looked around, I, I couldn't quite tell what this spot was in the middle of the woods in this one, and I looked around for other signs, but they're pretty fresh tracks, um, and it might have been me um, who scared it uh, into moving into that, that way, because the, the tracks were, were really fresh, so I think I, I just wanted to get away from me as, as fast as possible. Um, so, but they'll do that chasing things down, getting away is basically their you know, two main reasons to do that kind of uh, movement. And lastly, we're going to watch a little video uh, of the red fox here using all its senses. You know, we talked about you know how we use our senses to track. Red fox, are, of course, masters at it. Um, they're big ears; they're very sensitive. They can hear animals you know, underneath several feet of snow, um, mice and voles under there. Of course, they've got a great sense of smell as well. Um, they're <laughs> very um, you know potent set of uh, canines and incisors as well too that they uh, use to you know uh, eat their prey. Um, so we're going to watch a, a short video of a red fox hunting in North Dakota, um, looking a uh, deep snow, looking for um, mice and voles, which is a pretty fantastic. If you've never seen red fox hunting this way, uh, yeah, I think you're in for a treat here. So let's let's watch that. Deep snow covers the Black Hills of the Dakotas, and hidden under that icy blanket, field mice are stirring. The odds of catching anything might seem hopeless, but not to him. An enormous leap to catch a critter under three feet of snow. But how the heck did he do it? something but it takes immense an enormous leap to catch a critter under three feet of snow but how the heck did he do it he's holding in on something it takes immense concentration and he needs complete quiet. His ears can pick up the faintest scamper from beneath the snow. But there's a catch. He almost always comes up empty handed unless he's facing north. But how's that possible? As unbelievable as it sounds, scientists now think he's actually homing in on the magnetic field of the planet, using it to calculate and plot his trajectory. 
the kind of map missiles use to hit their targets. <clears throat> Just the slightest distraction can throw them off. the North Pole in his sights. He's guaranteed a meal nearly 75% of the time. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, it's kind of new to science. I haven't heard a lot about it before or since the whole North, you know, homing in in the magnetic field. It's a whole other sense that we don't even think about. But, you know, a lot of other animals, including birds, uh, you know, can feel that uh, magnetic field, which is, you know, again, um, a world that's uh, kind of lost to us. <clears throat> um, okay, moving on a little quickly here. Um, if you want to get to more of these animals, um, we do have uh, mink, of course, in the Northeast and in the park too, especially around, you know, aquatic resources. That's where they're most at home, of course. Um, and as a member of the weasel family, um, you know, all weasels are extremely talented at uh, hunting. Um, you know, uh, mink are more, more often, again, going after aquatic things like frogs and fish and crayfish and things like that. Uh, but we'll occasionally take, uh, you know, land-based animals too. Um, they're, they're not uh, you know, averse to that either, but uh, they're just specialized um, in, in animals near uh, rivers and, and streams and things like that, especially. Um, you know, on the smaller end, uh, one and a half to three and a half pounds or so. So, you know, about the half the size or less of a fisher a bit bigger than your, your ermines and your long-tailed weasels um, and almost always have this chocolate color too, even in winter, they don't change uh, the color of their coats unlike the, the ermines uh, and the long-tailed weasels do. <clears throat> um, they have, you know, appropriately small feet for their size. All weasels have five toes in the front and hind, though, you know, that fifth toe doesn't always show up so clearly. A lot of times you're only seeing these four toes, uh, the most robust, but you know, uh, sometimes, a lot of times that, that, that fifth toe will show. Um, and they have their preferred ways of moving uh, through the woods uh, and along their territories, just like every other animal. Um, as the snow gets deeper, um, mo a lot of weasels, including uh, fisher and uh, uh, mink, will use this called this kind of two by two pattern. And it's very similar to what we were talking about with the red fox in the sense that each hole in the snow is a front foot and a hind foot. Um, so when the, when the mink here bounded, you know, kind of left out of this way here, its hind feet land right in the exact same holes where its front two feet just left. Again, that helps save energy. Um, it's kind of like, you know, since this is the, the left hind foot here and right hind foot here, you can imagine, you know, if this animal was moving a little slower, this hind foot would have landed on top of that right foot and this one would have landed on top of that front foot. Um, so it's you know, a little bit slower of a pattern using that same philosophy as the faster an animal is going, the farther its hind feet are landing in front of the front feet. So this is a slightly faster pattern uh, of both than, than this one is because you know, that they're landing in front of the front feet. <clears throat> um, and um, mink, uh, you know, being, well, this is a, just a, a nice picture of, you know, it's always great. You know, you can go out there with your measuring tape, and I encourage you to do that, too, if you want, you know, especially when you're first starting out. But it's always, you know, nice when you can have uh, different species, you know, basically leave two tracks very close to each other. Um, you know, it kind of helps you, obviously, gauge size uh, a lot that way. And this is where a uh, fisher and a mink at uh, different times went by in different areas. So again, just shows you that, you know, there's kind of the size difference between uh, these two members of the weasel family. You know, fisher are, you know, quite a bit larger than mink. <clears throat> um, and there are, you know, I like to call them kind of special case studies uh, with a lot of animals and mink being, you know, very good at catching things and being very uh, apt to be near water and icy areas. Um, they will leave, uh, you know, kind of some unique tracks behind sometimes. Um, and this uh, is where a mink, you can see emerge from this hole in the ice. Um, those are clear tracks, but then all of a sudden there's something else going on here, these drag marks of some kind. Um, and what this is, is where uh, the animal had caught something. Um, hey, Heather. So Linda um, got a call and a lot of mute. sorry about if she could come down and help on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this coming week. Well, I guess I'll keep going. Hopefully that person will figure out they need to be on mute. 
um, somewhere. Um, and what we see here, and now this crayfish, like this photo, obviously, you know, for this mink, which is loaded to the ground, it's got short, stubby legs, um, and off it's going to be dragging that prey along with it. So, you know, this mink could have dug up, uh, you know, a crayfish or even a hibernating frog or, um, you know, a, a, a fish of some kind or something, and, you know, uh, just drags it when it's bringing it somewhere to either cache it. Uh, to put aside to eat for later or wants to eat it uh, in another more kind of sheltered place uh, and and not not uncommon to see these drag marks uh, of when you find mink tracks because they do catch so many things um let's go to um kind of a different uh, uh family here just so we can get more of a variety of different kinds of animals um let's do cat family which bobcats, which are all around us. So they're most uh, widely distributed wildcat in North America, you know, coast to coast, north to south. They're just, um, you know, their population density isn't that, uh, you know, heavy, which is why, and they're also very good at being secretive uh, and, you know, mostly nocturnal. So, um, you know, you don't see them very often, but they're out there um, for sure. Um, you know, they're right in our backyards uh, and in the, the park certainly has bobcat that uh, frequented as well. Um, and they can be, you know, fairly large, uh, you know, surprisingly large sometimes. There was one trapped in New Hampshire, I think in the 1980s, that was 52 pounds, um, which is unusual. Um, they don't usually get that large, you know. Again, males larger than the females in the species. So males can, you know, tip the scales, you know, 30 pounds. Uh, females, you know, closer to um, 15 to 20 pounds or so. Um, and, uh, you know, you can tell with the size differences as well as so we're looking at a male here and a female there and the male just does have even a more robust kind of skull uh, than the female um, in, in that view. Um, and speaking of tracking with their ears, you know, they don't really um, you know, make a lot of sounds, but when they're upset, they, they can make some uh, very interesting sounds. So let's take a listen to a kind of an upset bobcat here. <laughs> So, you know, obviously never approach a wild animal, but especially when it's making a sound like that, um, you know, probably a good idea to, to let them be. Um, and looking at their feet and their tracks, um, the and claws not often show in their tracks. They do have four toes in the front and behind. Um, and I kind of can I like to look at kind of the, the morphology of an animal too, the way it's built, it's a uh, it's skull even, just because it, it just gives us more kind of clues of so what kind of animal it is. And the most obvious kind of feature of a bobcat skull is these amazingly large eye sockets because, you know, most of its skull is eye um, and it's got, you know, even though we only see a tiny portion of it uh, through there. What, the reason it's so large is because it can capture, you know, more available light than we can by far. Um, you know, when we're tripping around at night in our houses, you know, trying to find a doorknob or something and the cats are probably just looking at us and be like, it's right there. Like, you can clearly see the doorknob because, you know, they uh, have these... Uh, eyes that can pick up way more light than, than we can and you know being a nocturnal animal obviously uh, it's a great advantage um they also these eyes point forward which is a very typical thing uh, for predator animals uh, animals that are seeking things to eat usually have this binocular vision two eyes pointing forward because it gives them better depth perception whereas an animal that's being hunted like deer for example are a good one those eyes tend to be more on the side of the head because you know they want to be able to see all around them almost to see when danger is approaching um, so, you know, usually when you have this kind of set after looking at a, a predator, which you certainly are with, uh, with bobcats, very little fur on the feet, uh, at least as far as on the toe pads anyway, which, you know, when the conditions are right, show very clearly. Um, and just to do a side-by-side -side comparison between cat and dog, this is a, a eastern coyote track here. Um, you know, you're probably not going to confuse them with each other too much, especially if you get super clear tracks like this, but uh, you don't always get that, of course, so sometimes, you know, it's nice to break these down into individual components. Um, and, you know, with dog cats, you have this X, uh, dog tracks, excuse me, you have these uh, kind of very symmetrical X marks the spot uh, kind of feature in the middle of them. You can fold them over on each other because they are symmetrical, whereas that's not true. With cat tracks, especially with the hind track, and we have one toe that's kind of a little higher than the other. You know, the toes don't seem to kind of be arranged all in the same way either. You can't draw that X in there; it's not symmetrical. But what it is does have is kind of this nice C curve that you can draw around the heel pad there, which is you know C for cat, which is nice. 
and also the hill pad itself it has these three bumps um, on both front and hind tracks but especially the hind track here which uh, you know m for meow for cat so um, you know that's kind of another nice uh, feature and then the two bumps on the top and the three in the bottom whereas the dog just gonna usually has just one bump at the top and sometimes you can make out three in the bottom but it's those two bumps at the top that really you know, signify that as a cat track <clears throat> um, house cats and bobcats. Um, you know, bobcats obviously, as you might imagine, you know, usually have much larger tracks um, in the order of a couple inches, whereas you know most house cats are in the order of about an inch or so. So uh, you know, usually about twice the size is kind of your you know good telltale feature that you're looking at a bobcat, not a house cat. Um, and when they're very clear too, you know, you get these beautiful tracks. This was in the national park a, a few years ago. Uh, a cat running in this rotary gallop. If we actually saw this bobcat, and it was a bobcat that was trying to, you know, kind of get to the woods quickly, so it wasn't uh, being seen anymore. So that's why it was running in this fast pattern. And remember, rotary is, uh, you know, where that foot falls in the body, you know, front right, um, rear, and front right, uh, and then um, front left, and then rear left. And uh, rear right. So again, going around in the, uh, the circular pattern there. And this is that from that same cat. Again, claw marks on often show, but it was in a slippery conditions. It was trying to get somewhere quickly and it has claw marks that are left behind. So again, you know, depending on conditions, sometimes they will do that. Um, just for the time's sake, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, so we can get to these patterns here. Um, and cats, you know, have their preferred ways of getting around. Um, and we, you know, again, if you have a house cat, you notice that a lot of times it's, you know, walking uh, around. It's, unless it's, you know, a very playful cat or, you know, uh, in playful mode, um, you know, most times they're walkers and they're getting from uh, spot A to spot B, which is, you know, same with their wild cousins as well. Um, and these are direct register a walking pattern here. Um, as is this here as well, um, a front foot landed right on top of that hind foot. But obviously something else is going on here in both of these. Um, and they share a couple of similar things, both at the top of a hill, you know, looking down in this lower area here, both in different spots. And cats as hunters, uh, for the most part, aren't uh, active hunters in the sense that they're not kind of, you know, loping or bounding through their territories, hoping to scare up a squirrel or something like that, like the fishers are and other weasels are much more active uh, hunters. Cats are kind of passive hunters. Well, they'll go to a place where they know there's going to be squirrels um, or something else that you know they'd like to eat. Uh, and they'll sit and wait. Um, they'll sit down and wait for that prey to come to them. Um, this is a pattern of a bobcat sitting down. It's just haunches are right here. It's front two feet are here. Um, this is similar, but not quite the same. This is a bobcat that was down on its haunches, uh, kind of squatting completely. Um, you know, hind feet here, but then it kind of walked its two front feet up so it could get down really low, which made me I saw something down there. These tracks are close enough together where it almost looks like it is a, um, a pattern where it's uh, stalking something uh, down below there. When I went to go investigate, I couldn't see if it had caught anything. It didn't look like anything immediately, but uh, you know, it was definitely interested in, in getting to something really quickly there. <clears throat> and I think we have uh, time for probably one more animal, and then we can open up to some, some questions here as well. Um, and let's do um, something else that we're, you know, a completely different kind of family, um, the bird family. Um, which I put wild turkey and grouse in the same one just because um, the tracks are so similar. Uh, just the size difference obviously is vast. Um, you know, an average mass of a rough grouse is just over 22 ounces, whereas you know, a large turkey can be 24 pounds. So obviously, you're dealing with you know, much different size animals. Um, wild turkeys tend to be in groups too, whereas you know, rough grouse tend more often to be solitary. Um, occasionally, there'll be you know, a few of them together but not as large groups as wild turkeys, that's for sure. Um, this is a close-up of some rough grouse feet. Um, at this time of year, they actually have the ability to grow their own snowshoes. These little combs that you see in the sides of their toes fall off in the spring. Um, they grow them in the winter, they're kind of made out of the same material as our, as our fingernails and toenails are, uh, which gives just that much more surface area, which allows them to walk on top of the snow more, you know, more readily than they would be able to without them, which is kind of a, a neat thing to be able to have, you know, be able to grow on your own feet. 
Um, here's another nice side-by-side -side comparison of two different animals, you know, a river otter that went this way and a uh, rough grouse um, that went that way. So again, you know, we can see it's quite a bit smaller. Um, and this is where a gray fox and, and a wild turkey went by. So again, you know, the size difference, even though the shapes of the tracks are pretty much the same, little arrows they look like um, as, as the animal's moving. Um, so it's, um, you know, same shape, but obviously much different size. Um, and this is a, a nice special kind of case study of uh, what a lot of rough grouse will do this time of year. Um, probably, you know, today, especially as it, the snow starts to fall, um, they will just kind of burrow down in the snow layer. Um, they'll fly out of the sky and kind of puff themselves into the snow and then let it cover them completely. Um, you know, the, what's called the subnivian layer below the surface layer of the, the snow, um, especially during colder spells. We haven't really had that many cold spells this winter, but you know, if it gets to 20 below zero or so, and we have several feet of snow out there, um, just, you know, a couple of feet below the surface of the snow, it stays pretty close to freezing, um, pretty close to 32 degrees, uh, you know, give or take. Maybe a little bit colder than that, but a lot warmer than 20 below zero, for sure. So, you know, I, I kind of ironic, they, you know, have to dig into the snow to stay warm, but they'll do that. Um, and, you know, just take shelter there during a, a storm, too. They don't necessarily have to move around. They will often, before they leave, uh, leave a deposit of scat behind. Um, so you'll see that. Um, and, you know, uh, it's happened to me many times. I don't know if it's happened to anybody here on the call, but sometimes you will be walking through the woods and about to take a step down and the rough grass will puff out of the snow right in front of you and scare the living crap out of you. Um, and it's making a lot of noise and the wings are very loud when it, when it comes out because that's the idea is to startle. You know, if a fox or something is coming up, hopefully it startles it real quick and it was able to make a getaway. Um, and, you know, this does kind of look a lot like, you know, um, Bullwinkle stuck his kind of face in the snow there and left a, a nice uh, you know, impression behind. But what that is, is it's two wings coming down um, and it got a little bit airborne after that. And so just the very tips of the feathers came down there. So you can see where uh, that rough grouse took off from. <clears throat> and another special case study with grouse, they do, they are very, you know, they like to be eaten by a lot of different things. This is where um, a red fox had eaten it. Red fox have very sharp teeth and they uh, great, they kind of sheared off the feathers in this nice, you know, clean cut as it was about to eat this uh, rough grouse. So you can see that clumps left behind there. Um, and I think just because we do, we're at one o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and call it there, at least as far as my formal presentation, but uh, I am willing to stick around for a little bit if people have some questions. Um, and I'm happy to answer those uh, and hopefully, you know, see some of you on Saturday as well. Ed, there's some questions in the chat. I don't know if you're able to see them or should I read them to you? Um, let me see if I can open up. Okay, I just figured out how to do that. So okay. <laughs> let's see. I guess I'll go um, maybe from some of the more recent ones here. Sorry, I will kind of kind of work our way backwards, I guess, because it's a little um, tricky. But any rec recommendations on trail cameras? Um, the only recommendation I have is get one that has a microphone in it. Um, most of them do now. Some of the earlier years, they didn't. And the microphone just adds, again, a, a whole other layer. Sometimes you can hear animals that you can't see on screen and you can hear them you know, communicating with each other. Um, it just adds a whole different layer to it. All, so many different camera companies make really good cameras now, so I think you can't go wrong. My, my recommendation is finding one on sale uh, and that has a microphone, I guess, is, is your best bet. And it does video, which almost all of them do now, too. Um, how important is snow cover to transfer the pheromones left behind in the tracks during breeding season? Will decrease snow cover due to climate change may not be harder for males and females to follow scents? Um, I don't think so. Snow... Uh, they will, you know, obviously when there's a lot of snow around, they'll, they'll use you know, the snow that's there, but, um, you know, more often than not, they'd like to use a rotting log or a stump is they're actually their favorite thing to leave scents on just because that holds the scent a lot longer than melting snow does. Um, so if they can find, a, you know, a stump or a log that's, um, you know, rotting, it just holds on to the, the moisture a lot more and the scent a lot longer too. So I don't think, you know, the snow is, has going to have, you know, losing stuff now that much of a, um, impact on that. Um, are head tilts to hear better or echolocate rather than see? Yes, uh, a combination of both probably. 
Um, but I think we're looking at that red fox. And that was to kind of triangulate, you know, where it was hearing um, uh, because they're both ears are so sensitive um, you know, that can help them better locate uh, where things are not, you know, not quite a true echo locate, um, which I think is more kind of, uh, you know, um, thing that bats do, you know, but this is sounds that we can hear as well too, but, you know, red fox obviously a lot better. Um, what kind of communication gesture is this gape mouth pick? <laughs> I think that's where I had his mouth wide open when we were about to uh, see it eat. That was a yawn. Um, and yawns actually kind of are interesting in the sense that even when you see your dog or cat yawn, it's not always because they're tired necessarily. It sometimes it means they're anxious. I have a feeling that photo was taken, somebody was getting close to that red fox and they were uncomfortable. So they did this kind of fake yawn, which shows you, you know, a big set of very sharp teeth um, uh, as another way of doing it too. So, um, you know, I think that's you know, a big reason that we had uh, that the photo showed that um, red fox like that. <clears throat> and let's see, let's see. Um, a lot of thank yous. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate that. Um, and I'll do a, a couple more questions here. Um, let's see, your presentation was excellent. Thank you. And opened up a whole new world for me as an educator of children. Will this be recorded uh, and available? I think that is true, Jillian. Yeah, I just linked the YouTube channel in the chat where it will be recorded and uploaded soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, when will you do this again so you can learn more about other animals on the list? Um, yeah, um, I, I think I'm, I don't remember if I'm doing another one.